Welcome everybody to the Planning and Strategic Initiatives Committee for Monday, August 13th, 2018. Uh, no, there's no consent items. Uh, this is a public hearing matters under the Planning Act. This is a formal public meeting to consider applications under the Planning Act. If a person or public body that would otherwise have an ability to appeal a decision of the City of Kitchener to the local planning appeal tribunal, but the person of the public body does not make oral submissions at the public meeting or make written submissions to the City of Kitchener before the bylaw is passed, the person or the public body is not entitled to appeal the decision. And with that, we'll move on to the ag agenda items, and uh, we are going to move item number two first to deal with, uh, which is dealing with uh, Hidden Valley Residential Community pl Action plan, uh, plan. And, and uh, is Mr. Pinnell, is he here? Or is it, that was, go ahead, Mr. Pinnell. Sorry, go ahead. Through you, Mr. Chair. The subject properties are located uh, at, uh, on Hidden Valley Road and addressed as 1054 and 1070 Hidden Valley Road. They're located on the south side of the road and uh, just east of River Valley Drive. The lands are 2.4 hectares or six acres in area and are composed of two abutting lots. Next slide, please. The surrounding neighborhood is composed of single detached dwellings spread out along Hidden Valley Road and single detached dwellings within the estate lot subdivisions to the east, Bridal Path Estates, and to the south, Hidden Valley Estates. The lands on the opposite side of Hidden Valley Road are within a residential subdivision that is draft approval but has not yet been developed. These lands are owned by Pearl Valley Estates, Pearl Valley Development Corporation rather. The applicant has submitted a subdivision application, official plan amendment, and zone change in order to allow the construction of a nine lot subdivision. As you can see from the proposed subdivision plan on the screen, seven of the lots have primary frontage onto a new cul-de-sac road. This road is proposed to be named George Schuftis Place after the late husband of the former owner of the lands. Two of the, two of the lots would also have primary frontage on Hidden Valley Road itself. All of the lots within the subdivision would be on full municipal services, and the lots would range in area from approximately 1,000 to 5,000 square meters in area. An official plan uh, amendment is necessary in order to allow all lots uh, fronting onto Hidden Valley Road to have a minimum area of 929 square meters and a width of 24 meters. Also, a zoning bylaw amendment is necessary to change the zoning from R1 to R2 uh, to allow lot area and width relief while retaining the large lot character of the subdivision. The proposed lots will be comparable in area and width to the lots in the Hidden Valley Estates subdivision to the south. In conclusion, the proposal would ensure that, the, uh, that zoning and lands intended for large lots would be retained as part of the city's residential inventory. This would ensure a diversity of housing within the city since large lot zoning is a finite resource. To ensure compatibility with adjacent residential areas and to ensure high quality design, design guidelines for priority lots, a priority lotting plan and a streetscape planting plan are required as conditions of approval. The subdivision will make use of existing public infrastructure and services without the need for expansion, including a pumping station and a stormwater man management facility. The proposal conforms to city, regional, and provincial policies. Planning staff is recommending approval of the application sub subject to draft approval recommend uh, conditions. Planning and transportation services staff, as well as the applicant, are here tonight for questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mr. Pinnell. We do have a delegation. And pursuant to Council's procedural bylaw, delegations are permitted to address the committee for a maximum of five minutes. And we have Mr. Brandon Flew-Allen from GSP Group. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Committee. My name is Brandon Flewelling, and I'm the uh, consultant to the, uh, the property owner. Um, if you'll recall, we were here approximately a year ago, maybe just over a year ago, with a, a different proposal. The proposal at that time was for 40 executive townhomes on a private condominium road. 
there was fairly strong resistance from uh, from the neighborhood for uh, that that type of use, and uh, planning staff as well was not supportive at, at that time. Uh, so we went away and we we looked at the plan again, and we're back before you tonight with a, a much different proposal. As Mr. Pinnell identified, it's for nine single detached lots. Um, it's proposed for an R2 zoning similar to the Hidden Valley Estate subdivision uh, to the south of the subject property and much more in keeping with, uh, with the surrounding land uses. The, um, the, the comments we heard the first time through was that you know, there's, there's a limited supply of, of these large, large estate type lots, whether R1 or, or R2 type of zoning. Um, so what we've come back with is, is a proposal for an R2 zoning. Uh, there is an official plan amendment required as noted for the homes fronting onto Hidden Valley Drive. And really that's required, um, the, the Hidden Valley plan, secondary plan identified or, or really was, uh, came to be at the time when there weren't municipal services available um, in this area. The proposed development will be on full municipal services. Uh, and the frontages and the lot areas for the two lots fronting on the Hidden Valley Drive are, are consistent with the R2 zoning, uh, and therefore the, the site-specific official plan amendment has been has been requested. There were comments about about those two lots in particular and the driveways entering onto Hidden Valley Road and or Drive, and whether there was any safety concerns with that. However, as part of our, our submission, we we've met with uh, with city staff, transportation department. And it's been identified that through signage and, and proposed speed humps on Hidden Valley Drive, that the site distances are sufficient to, for, for these driveways, for the, the proposed George Shoof Place Road intersection as well, um, that the sight lines, because of reduced speeds, because of signage and, uh, and the speed humps, are, are suitable and uh, therefore within the safety parameters that uh, the Transportation Department was looking for. The, um, there's a zoning amendment required, as I, as I indicated, from an R1 to an R2 zone. And it was noted one, one lot in particular doesn't quite meet the minimum lot frontage of 24 meters, or, or lot width of 24 meters. But when you look at, uh, it's a large pie-shaped lot. So if you measure it, the six meter setback, we're at 23 meters, whereas 24 is required. But if you went back to the seven meter setback, we would, we would achieve the, um, the, the 24 meters as required. So. It just, because of retaining the existing home on the property and creating a lot around that, um, there was just a, a small pinch point to make it all work. And it was, it was thought that uh, that minor relief through a site-specific zoning uh, was appropriate. You'll notice on the plan that there's a, a sanitary sewer easement identified along lot seven heading um, over to uh, River Birch Drive. And the purpose of that is that along Hidden Valley Drive, there's a, a, region, a regional trunk uh, main, which makes servicing the subdivision uh, along the Hidden Valley frontage more expensive and more difficult, just in terms of, you know, operationally, how do you how do you work around this this regional main? Uh, so that sanitary easement has been identified, and subject to detailed design, it, it's anticipated that that is where the sanitary sewer connection would go. Um, the result of that is that lot seven has a, uh, it's a very deep lot, but it's perhaps not as wide, or the building envelope location isn't as wide as maybe some of the other lots. But this simply allows for a unique, uh, unique lot. It's, there's still 50 feet of building width that, that would be available for that lot. Um, and I certainly think a custom home can easily be designed to, uh, to fit on that, that lot without any, any concerns. Uh, lots eight and nine, as I mentioned, front onto Hidden Valley Drive. Uh, which, is, which is the norm on, on the south side of Hidden Valley. The, the adjacent property um, to the west as well as the next two to the east all, um, all front onto Hidden Valley Drive. So this isn't out of character. There, there are other homes further down on the north side of Hidden Valley that are accessed off of a, a private road connecting to Hidden Valley. But the proposal to have two lots fronting onto Hidden Valley uh, from an urban design perspective helps to you know, have front doors facing the street and uh, you know, provides a better connection to the neighborhood. So we think that's a reasonable request. As I said, the site line analysis has been completed, um, reviewed by city staff and supported. Um, and with all of that, we're, we're here in full support of the staff report as, as written and the recommendations for approval of the, the draft plan, the official plan amendment, and the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. So as my time's up, that's, uh, I'll conclude my remarks, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. We do have a question for you, Councillor Fernandez. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brendan, for coming in uh, and, and going through your presentation. So if I'm looking at the map um, that was, I think it was the same one that's on page 2-54, which is the one that was put up on the screen here, um, the easement that you just spoke of, how does that affect that property owner's ability to use that property? So say if they wanted to put a pool in, um, you know, or, or you know, build anything that would be a permanent structure on that, on that site, does that impede them from, from doing that? Through you, Mr. Chair, it would on the easement itself. Um, however, as you can see on the, the plan up there, it, it's a very deep lot. It's, it's 64 meters in depth. So again, it might be it's more of a, a long, narrow house versus a you know a wide, shallow house or, or something. But a custom design could certainly accommodate a home in there. There's ample rear yard space for pools and sheds and whatnot. That would be outside of the easement area. But but you are correct. There wouldn't be any permanent structures permitted on the easement. Okay. Um, in the um, uh, the the detailed information around the uh, site. Sorry, I just want to make sure I'm referring to it properly. Um, the plan of the subdivision and all the criteria. It talks about uh, uh, on 6-18 the infiltration gallery. So each of these properties are expected to have a front yard infiltration gallery. Is that correct? Am I correct? I mean, if I'm asking you a question that I should be asking of staff, just please let me know. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, the, I guess we, we've submitted preliminary stormwater management plans and infiltration galleries are proposed. Um, I, I don't want to speak for the engineers, but generally that's uh, the desired course of action these days is to, to get the, the clean water back into the ground as, as quickly as possible. So the preliminary design anticipates that, um, but obviously through the detailed design in achieving the draft plan uh, conditions, the, we'd have to make sure that we can satisfy that, but it, we don't see any concerns. And I don't either. I apologize if I phrased my question incorrectly. I, I think what um, this, this paragraph refers to is the property owner's responsibility on making sure that the infiltration gallery continues to function as it does at their own cost. That will be something that would be in the ownership agreement? Through you, Mr. Chair. That's a, a fairly standard condition that would be included in the subdivision agreement, which is registered on title and um, applicable to each of the, the future homeowners. Okay. Uh, and you refer to, uh, so just quickly, the opinion of the surrounding residents is, is much more positive than what you brought forward a year and a bit ago, I'm assuming. Through you, Mr. Chair. Certainly we heard, um, heard pretty loud and clear last time through that um, the proposal for executive townhomes wasn't supported by, by staff or the neighborhood. Um, and that's, that's why we find ourselves here today with a, a proposal for an R2 zoning, single detached lots, um, you know, similar in zoning to Hidden Valley Estates to the south. You're demolishing a property, um, and I don't know if it, or a building, sorry, not a property. You're demolishing uh, a building. Is that on lot nine, or is it on the existing 1084 address? Through you, Mr. Chair, it's roughly on, on lot nine. It's a, it's a, a small uh, little dwelling that's been boarded up for, for years and years, and it, it needs to come down, and it will come down. Okay. All right. I do have a couple questions of staff at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Yanesky. This subdivision, as you pointed out, will be uh, on full services, correct? That is correct. Okay. So I gather from your presentation that the full services would be uh, servicing all the lots with the uh, main uh, sanitary sewer being on the cul-de-sac, running through the easement through lot five to the back and out the, through the south, through those lands. The lot nine, and you also mentioned there won't be no services, full services on Hidden Valley Drive, correct? So, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, that there will be, there, is, there are existing services. We, the connection, a typical connection would, would be um, from the cul-de-sac along Hidden Valley Drive down to uh, the closest sanitary sewer at, at, River, at River Valley Drive. Um, However, because of the regional, there's a regional trunk main along Hidden Valley, um, it, it's, it's much more straightforward to, to do this connection through the west, um, and that's why the design has been, been laid out this way. Um, but to answer your question, full, full municipal services are, are proposed, uh, including water and sanitary. So for, for Lot 9, its servicing will come through Lot 7 to, to, to the cul-de-sac, right? 
That's correct. The sanitary connection would be through to the rear of, of lot nine and lot eight. Okay. So why is the sanitary sewer easements all the way back to the, to the back of, the, of lot seven? Wouldn't it maybe just be best to cut it off at the at westerly edge of lot nine? Through you, Mr. Chair, it needs to continue to the rear of lot seven so that it can continue further west all the way over to River Valley Drive. There's a, there's a city open space block between River Valley Drive to the west and the rear of lot seven and the, the sanitary sewer would uh, connect through that down to River Valley Drive. So that's for the potential development of lands to the west, basically. It would connect to the existing services that are already existing to the west, that is correct. Right. And so what's the total width of that easement through Lot 7? The total width is 10 meters. 10 meters? Is that pretty too, too generous? Maybe, shouldn't it be smaller? I'm just sort of thinking back on my other easements that you have. When you look at the one here going through lot five, it seems to be much, much narrower. Through you, Mr. Chair, the, the reason for the, the width of it is because of uh, the depth. So there's a standard engineering principle, I guess, of the width has to be twice the depth, or I forget the, the exact measurement, but you need room to excavate the side slopes to safely put the pipe in. So. Oh, okay, and, and that's true. I didn't realize how, how deep you had to go for, for that. So, okay, you've answered all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nessie. Councillor Marsh. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Just, um, we received a letter today uh, that I just reviewed uh, saying that, uh, well, there's a, there's a number of things in here, but one of them is that uh, previous developments had were not allowed to have any frontage on Hidden Valley Road. <clears throat> And I'm wondering why uh, lot eight and nine were not um, considered to be one lot that then would front on to the new private road and and uh, avoid that that problem. Through you, Mr. Chair, the, to come up with the, the most efficient use of the land, to be honest, there's, there's just there there's a sufficient area to, to provide two lots as we've identified here, and the Hidden Valley Community Plan that that had that um, stipulation was really based on when there were only private services available. And it was trying to maintain larger lots because you needed larger area for, for private, private services. Because these lots are gonna, going to be on full municipal services, and from an urban design perspective, we, we thought it was appropriate to, to have phone, phones, homes that, that face onto the street, provide that front door onto Hidden Valley Drive, same as the, the next door neighbor to, to the east or to the west and the other homes further to the east. Um, they all have driveways and their front doors facing onto Hidden Valley Drive. Um, so it seemed like an appropriate, appropriate from an urban design perspective, uh, appropriate from a servicing perspective, from a zoning perspective, um, and, and that's really where it comes from. Mm. Okay, so sorry, the, um, the neighbor to the west is, it does have one driveway, or are there multiple driveways along Hidden Valley now? This is old news? Through you, Mr. Chair, the neighbor to the west has at least two driveways, one being for the dwelling, and then there's actually one further west just for a, a separate garage building. And then as you head east, um, the driveways on the south side of Hidden Valley also um, you know, come, come up to the front door, more or less, of the existing homes there. So okay. these, while, while the lots to the east are, um, you know, are larger, deeper lots, the, the, the presence and the, the face of the home is, is facing towards Hidden Valley. And this is just maintaining that, that same character. Well, no, it's not a deep lot. It, it, in fact, they're combined. They're smaller than a lot of the lots that you're proposing here. So that doesn't, it just sounds like it's, an, it's another way to make a little more money to me. Like, uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand that. But anyway, that's a comment, not a question. Uh, I guess I will also want to know, <clears throat> um, can you remind me uh, where the uh, you're proposing to put uh, speed bumps? Through you, Mr. Chair, there, the um, the the, the uh, sight line analysis that was submitted um, anticipated a uh, speed hump on Hidden Valley Drive. I I, I don't know the exact. I, I don't have the drawing with the exact locations, but there there is a crest in the hill there, and it, the idea is to um, and ensure that traffic coming up the hill from both directions is slowed down. So. There would, there would be one proposed on, on each side of the, um, of the proposed new cul-de-sac beyond the limits of the, of the subject property. Okay, so you want to put two driveways on Hidden Valley Road and also 
uh, two speed humps to essentially make sure that uh, those driveways have safe uh, access and egress. Through you, Mr. Chair, the, the, the sight line analysis was really the, the biggest concern was the location of the proposed cul-de-sac and the sight lines from there and whether you could adequately see people coming up the hill from the east. Um, so that was the main, the first purpose of, of doing the sight line analysis was to make sure that um, the, the cul-de-sac would function in a safe manner. And um, in a result of doing that, it, it was identified that that would be uh, a safe location uh, for a new public street, and that also then identified that the, the driveways would uh, would also function in a safe manner, because because again there are sufficient sight line distances to for someone backing out or or pulling out of a driveway to see any oncoming traffic in either direction. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fluell. We don't have any more questions for you. Okay, thank you. Questions of staff, Councillor Yvonne Fernandez. Thank you. Um, yes, just carrying on with the conversation about the speed hump. So the letter that we just received on our desk, one of the concerns um, that they stated was that um, some of the residents have expensive sports cars and that the clearance in the road would not be would not allow those cars to clear the speed humps. Do we have any comment or information on whether that would be true, or would we use something alternatively like um, our speed cushions, which we've used? as well. Okay. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, speed humps are typically designed so that they're, they're fully cleared. If you have a sports car, you can still, there's sufficient clearance. Okay. And these would be put, would be installed by the city or by the developer? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, I believe that we would, in this case, only require one speed hump. Essentially, we're requiring one to ensure visibility and that we would work with the developer to secure funds for that hump and have uh, city forces install the speed hump to maintain consistency. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Pinnell, I guess I'm, ta I'm, I'm thinking about the infiltration galleries, and of course my concern for any development in and around Hidden Valley is the, the, uh, the infiltration, the water quality quantity that going into the, into the Hidden Valley. Um, just trying to orient myself when I'm looking at this diagram. Um, water flowing out of this subdivision will be going south into the valley or will be going north across the road. I, I, I'm, it's hard to see on a, on a picture like this. And I think you had a broader map picture. Mm -hmm. If you can bring that up, maybe that will help me. Through you, Mr. Chair, this one's the. This is probably the best map we have. Um, it, the one you had before. Sorry to interrupt you. It was actually better, just because it shows it in a general perspective. Sorry, the the. Uh, oh, sorry, the. Uh, that sorry. one. Yeah. Okay. Super. Thank you. So, the uh, the grades of the site uh, drain from from north to south. Th this site is actually up on a shelf. Um, everything behind it is uh, is uh, uh, much lower in grade. Uh, the uh, the water will um, that that flows onto uh, George Shufta's place will will drain south and then uh, go into storm sewers and uh, go through the uh, servicing easement uh, that that runs between lots four and five. Uh, as far as the infiltration galleries go, the exact placement of those will be determined through the uh, the engineering design, which will take place as a condition of approval. But in the preliminary uh, stormwater management uh, design, it does show that uh, that this infiltration, um, these infiltration galleries are, are important and necessary, and uh, we'll, we'll determine the, the uh, exact placement through the next steps. Okay, and I think they are very important. And now that I've seen this map, the area that I am always I'm concerned about is actually north on this map, which is the valley and and uh, where the wildlife is and the endangered species. And this is on on land that's already been compromised by development that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was the, uh, have you received the letter that um, the resident from 2043 sent in to us? Yes, I did. Okay, yep. and do, do you have any comments or um, concerns, responses to their concerns about the objection of the uh, approval of the OPA? 
specifically the OPA? Yeah, because they're talking, of course, about the front lotting onto Hidden Valley Road and the fact that previous developers were not allowed to construct driveways onto Hidden Valley Road. Do you feel that the developer now has, it, has addressed all of the concerns that are listed in this letter? I, I think something needs to be said uh, first about uh, lots fronting onto Hidden Valley Road. The official plan currently does allow lots facing onto Hidden Valley Road. There's no prohibition on that. Uh, it, there are certain uh, criteria that, that are to be met in order to allow that. And uh, there, are some, uh, there, are, there is some relief being requested, specifically uh, reducing the width of the lots from 30 to 24 meters and the lot area from um, 0.4 hectares down to 929 square meters. Um, we feel that those uh, reductions are, are appropriate in this case um, because they're using full municipal services. There's no need to have uh, these uh, estate lot, um, massive estate lots, uh, because uh, the, the, the servicing basically does away with the, the need for the, the, the extra land for septic fields and whatnot. Um, so we feel it is appropriate to... Uh, um, to allow lots fronting on Hidden Valley Road. The safety issues have been addressed as far as visibility goes. Um, right now, there are a number of houses that do face on to Hidden Valley, and um, specifically the one to, the, to the, uh, the, the west, 1084, and the lots uh, to, to the east of the subdivision. So by allowing lots onto Hidden Valley Road, we would be creating a, a streetscape of sorts, um, which we feel is a positive thing. Okay, thank you. And just a quick question. So the property that, if I'm viewing the map here, to the, to the right of uh, the very strong, long, straight red line, um, that is st still privately owned? Yes. And there, there is a small strip of land that is uh, owned by the, uh, the Cruz, uh, Mr. Cruz, uh, who developed the subdivision to the south. But apart from that strip that's immediately to the east, it's, it's all owned uh, privately. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Fernandez. Councillor Gazzola. Click out. Sorry, I, I don't have any questions. At the appropriate time, I would like to move the recommendation of staff. The appropriate time is now. I so move it. Yeah. <laughs> I see we have no, no further questions. Anyone want to make comments or anything? No? I'll we'll call the question. All those in favor? Oh. Councillor Ineski. Yes, having uh, reviewed this application, and uh, just to provide just a short brief comments, I think the decision in terms of recommendations here by staff and working with the developer and reducing it from the uh, higher density that was initially proposed with the townhouses back last year is the uh, right uh, direction to go because we are limited in large size lots in, in the community and the Hidden Valley area happens to be one of the, the last areas that are able to, uh, to, to provide that type of uh, uh, development to fit into the character of the homes that are there right now. So uh, in my opinion, this is uh, good planning by staff. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? One opposed? That's been carried. Okay, so we're dealing on with item number one now, with the city initiated zoning bylaw amendment. And Ms. Goss and Mr. And Mr. Bateman will be providing a presentation. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council and members of the public. This is a statutory public meeting for a city-initiated zoning bylaw amendment to implement two recommendations from the Residential Intensification and Established Neighborhood Study. This statutory public meeting was advertised in the July 20th edition of the record, and an email was sent to the RIENS contact list also on July 20th. 
The zoning bylaw amendment was posted on the city's website on July 20th and also as part of the agenda package for this committee meeting. In March of last year, Council endorsed the Residential Intensification in Established Neighborhoods study. The study recommended numerous things, but four changes specifically to the city's zoning bylaw. One being a consistent building setback from the street, maximum building heights, garage projections, and it also recommended that staff look at whether properties that are currently zoned R6 or R7, and those are our existing zones that permit low-rise multiple dwellings, among other dwelling types, uh, whether those sites are appropriately zoned if they're in areas that are predominantly uh, surrounded by single detached dwellings. When Council endorsed that study, they also directed staff to explore additional flexibility for zoning regulations related to building height and front yard setback. The City initiated zoning bylaw amendment that is before you this evening. Staff is recommending to implement two of the recommendations from that study. Full implementation of the, re, the REN's recommendations from a zoning perspective is going to take some time through the city's comprehensive zoning bylaw review process and neighborhood planning reviews. It'll take the next two or so years to do that and requires some more site and area specific study. Staff con continues to see development proposals in the REN study area and this zoning bylaw amendment will help to ensure that the council endorsed study is able to be implemented on the ground sooner. Just go over quickly the two regulations that are proposed in the zoning bylaw amendment. The first deals with a new way of calculating a front yard setback. There's two diagrams on this slide that help to illustrate that. The front yard setback regulation is based on the average of the two adjacent properties. Staff have built in regulations to deal with situations where the vacant lot or the lot that is proposed to be built on is a corner lot. We've also built in for a situation where if the lot that's being proposed to be built on, the adjacent lot is vacant, we've built in regulations to deal with that situation as well. The other thing that this proposed regulation does is it provides flexibility while maintaining the intent of the regulation by incorporating a one meter tolerance into the regulation. What this means is that once you've established your average setback line based on your neighbor to the right and your neighbor to the left, you can then locate the front face of your building one meter closer to the street or one meter farther from that average setback line. Staff have tested out a number of different tolerance scenarios, so we've played with different numbers. Last year when we tabled a first draft of residential zones through the new zoning bylaw, we tested out a one meter to the front of the average line and two meters to the rear of that average line. We found that what we're proposing in this zoning bylaw amendment provides the greatest certainty of maintaining the existing streetscape character while at the same time providing some flexibility. The second regulation in the proposed zoning bylaw amendment deals with garages. And what it does is establishes a base rule for projecting garages. Quite simply, it states that any attached garage may not be closer to the street than the front face of the rest of the, of the dwelling. In the city's current zoning bylaw, there are regulations for garages and how much they can project into the front yard. But they only apply to lots that have been created since 2000 if you're building a single detached dwelling or a duplex, and they also only apply to lots that were created in 2006 or later for semi-detached dwellings and street fronting townhouses. There are no rules right now for the placement of, a, of an attached garage for lots that have existed pre-2000. What the regulations do uh, in the proposed zoning by Lemon is it would establish a rule that deals with projecting garages on older lots, especially in established neighborhoods. Since we published a notice in the record on July 20th, staff have had conversations with four people regarding this proposed amendment. As a result of those conversations, staff is recommending an amendment to our original recommendation I hope that was circulated, so it has been circulated to members of committee. 
The amended recommendation is on the slide. Simply, it's that we're recommending that the proposed zoning bylaw amendment be approved as it implements two of the zoning recommendations from the council-endorsed study as an interim measure until the city completes its neighborhood planning reviews and our Crosby process. The zoning bylaw amendment is consistent with the Region of Waterloo official plan and Kitchener official plan and is also consistent with the provincial policy statement and the growth plan. Staff, and this is the amended part, staff is recommending uh, that staff further consider whether refinements to any of the proposed zoning regulations as part of this amending bylaw are necessary through future neighborhood planning reviews and the residential component of our comprehensive review of our zoning bylaw. The intent of the second part of the recommendation is to confirm through council resolution staff's original intent to continue to study these areas and these neighborhoods in more detail uh, through our ongoing work. And that concludes the staff presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We do have some questions. Councillor Marsh. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to move this at the appropriate time. Okay. Councillor Fernandez. Thank you. Um, I do have a number of questions, so I may go over my time. Um, you said, I'm going to go actually to my last question because it, you brought it up in your presentation about the four comments that you received. Um, and you may or may not be able to answer this properly or it may not be appropriate, but the comments that you received, were they in relation to people who have applications that they're anticipating bringing forward and therefore they had concerns about this amended bylaw? Through the chair, no, they were not. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about front yard setbacks and we're talking about location of garages, but I don't see anything in the side yard setbacks. And I know that there was some discussion around um, the reins and, and that process about set side yards. Is that coming in the next iteration of the, the um, recommendations around reins? Through the chair, it's our, recollec our recollection that that wasn't part of the recommendations in the study, um, nor was it part of a council resolution at that time. However, the zoning bylaw does deal with side yard setbacks um, and the placement of any building within those side yard setbacks. If a garage is attached, it would need to comply with the side yard setback regulations of the base zone. Okay. okay. So when you added that extra couple of words, that, that, that helps me understand that. So in an existing neighborhood around where Reens has been studied, if somebody was to um, do a addition and they were to put a garage on, not only would they have to be taken into consideration where it does sit in the front yard, but also if any garage is in the street, for example, where that garage would sit in relation to the side yard of the existing property to, to the right or to the left. So through the chair, the, the zoning bylaw regulations that are before you only deal with a change to the front yard setback mm -hmm. regulation. So if one were to propose an attached garage, under the new rules, it would say that the front face of that garage cannot project any farther into the front yard than the rest of that, that house. That attached garage is also subject to the averaging rule that okay. we're putting in place. It is also subject to the existing uh, side yard setback regulations and rear yard setback regulations and all the other regulations that are within the zone. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, do we have um, any applications that are have been pushed forward or, or are sort of in, in the hopper, so to speak, that this amended bylaw would affect? Well, through the chair, every month is year where we have committee of adjustment applications, so we do have some. And uh, I mean, the ones that are in process right now, Councillor Fernandez, would still be under the existing rules. Um, and then once this comes into effect, then they will, uh, then the new rules will apply to those. Okay. We certainly, you know, um, since Rianne's and even before Rianne's, this is something we've 
always, uh, I don't want to get the impression that we, as staff, that we've, we've you know, we uh, forget or neglect, you know, what the existing streetscape is. And we would always encourage an applicant to keep, be mindful of that when they're siting their building, to try and be in line with what is on the ground right now. Just that the existing zoning, the four and a half meter setback, always doesn't give us that final, um, What's the word? Uh, yeah, I guess tool to say, hey, you know, you have to you have to be in line with existing homes, right? So, when push comes to shove, we can't always force that, but certainly we would encourage that through that. So. Okay. So this will become ratified at council. Any applications after the ratification at council would have to fall under these proposed guidelines. Is that correct? That's correct, and then after the appeal period is, is done as well. So, it, there's a third so if it gets ratified by council, the appeal period, and then it would become in force and effect after that. Okay, all right. I always worry that during that appeal period, you're going to get a flurry of, of applications, and, and you know, they're sort of in, in a limbo situation in a way, right? They're trying to get in before it becomes you know, law and, 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 and more enforceable than it is presently. So that, that's more of a comment, sorry. Um, and I know we're only dealing with these two amendments, but the other two that I have concerns around are the, uh, the height and the pitch of roofs. Uh, are we going to see that with the Crosby uh, process being completed, or is through that? Through the chair, yes, it'll either be through the residential component of Crosby, but probably more likely through the neighborhood-specific reviews that we're doing. What we're finding as we get out there and look around these neighborhoods is that some of these height regulations in particular and garage regulations really are area specific. So depending on the predominant um, character of the houses and garages in those neighborhoods is where we need to take the cue from for writing these regulations. So we weren't comfortable at this stage recommending a base rule that dealt with building height and reducing it from uh, the permitted 10 and a half meter uh, building height to something lower um, that the study recommended for bungalows until we know where the areas are that are predominantly bungalows. So it's something that will be coming over the next couple of years. Okay. I'm sad to hear you say years. I would have been nice to see, <laughs> heard you say months, but I know it's, it's, it's a huge process. But one quick last question, um, and that was because I took a look uh, at the uh, engagement guide and, and all of the stakeholders that, that participated the citizens guide um, was a, was a was a constant sort of request uh, and where are we on that and I know that's outside of the purview of what we're what we're approving here tonight but I just wanted to ask that question Janine through the chair um, the citizen guide has been published I believe I did a communication to um, members of council in the spring sometime about it. Um, and there are um, booklets in council office as well as um, in planning. And we also updated the website with that information. So it is um, active and available at this moment. Okay, thank you. I may have um, put that with some of my other planning stuff, but I'll yeah. look for it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Councillor Etherington. Through you, Mr. Chair, to either Ms. Goss or Mr. Bateman. My understanding, and you can straighten me out on this, but my understanding of what we're considering here tonight is a percentage of the residential intensification in established neighborhoods, Rianne's. Can you tell me how much we're considering here tonight? I know that's a tricky question, but percentage-wise, would it be a third or a quarter or? I think there were, through the chair, uh, there were five recommendations, I recall, zoning type regulation recommendations from Rienz, and I think this is Natalie or Janine, I, I think it was five council, I think, and we're implementing two of them. So there's the, there's the, there's still, there's still the, um, the garage typology, building height, and then the R6 and R7 zone lands still remaining of those remaining recommendations from Rienz that we still need to study and we will do that as Natalie has said through uh, through the secondary plan updates. 
I appreciate that. It's hard for the public to understand these different sections of planning uh, regulations. What I'm most concerned about is you know, a higher rise development being plunked in the center, or less, being plunked in the center of a, an established residential neighborhood. When will that be addressed? So through the chair, that's something that we will explore through the residential component of our comprehensive zoning bylaw review. In, in some senses, it has been established through council's approval of the 2014 official plan. However, uh, that official plan um, deferred to the secondary plan work, and that's something that we are working through right now. So as we do the land use review, we determine through public consultation what the appropriate land uses are from a residential perspective, and whether it should be low rise, medium rise, high rise, low rise conservation, or, or what the, the land use framework should be, and then the zoning simply implements that. So it's through that body of work that you'll see us look at where it's appropriate to locate some higher density residential uses. And on page 1-2 of your report, I'll just quote to you, at this time staff anticipates that it may take two or more years to implement draft new residential zones across the approximately 50,000 residential properties within Kishner. Additionally, there continues to be development proposals in the central neighborhoods, and it would be beneficial to have the new regulations in place sooner rather than later. That is what I'm concerned about. And that's what the public's concerned about. And yet we're still talking about garages and uh, setbacks. So through the chair, that's one of the reasons why we brought forward the city-initiated zoning bylaw amendment at this time, is to get some measures in place. And as Mr. Bateman said, we know the study is there. We know that it is council-endorsed, and we do inform uh, applicants and property owners of its existence and when they make applications and do inquiries at the counter. So we do make them aware of the intent. Uh, we have tabled draft residential zones in the spring of last year. We did table with that um, regulations uh, that implement all of the RIAN's recommendations. They haven't been applied to properties yet, but the regulations are out there, so we know that if we need to use a particular garage regulation that may say that the garage should not only not be attached to the house, but it should be you know, detached or you can't have a garage at all or it should be farther recessed, we have those all pre-written, so as we go out into these neighborhoods and find out what the predominant character is, they're written and we can start applying them. It is 50,000 properties in the city. We do have a staff complement of... We had a staff complement of about three. Um, before I'll be quite honest, it is, it is a challenging uh, process. We like to do well above and beyond public consultation. It's important that we consider the existing character in these neighborhoods before we apply uh, rules that may be perceived as a little bit more restrictive as we try to deal with regulating uh, existing character of neighborhoods. Mr. Chair, I can't see the clock. Do I have any time? I've been providing leeway. If you want to ask another question, go ahead. Okay, my other question in relation to that comment I just read or that quote I just read. Do you anticipate a rash of development proposals in the downtown neighborhoods during the next two or three years or more? The time that you're required to establish these rules in law? Through the chair, no, we don't. Uh, this, the statistics that we have on the time frame um, from when the RIAN study was initiated and now doesn't suggest that there's a huge rash of, of development. Uh, developers typically know that um, we are open for business and more open for business in our intensification areas. We are talking about established neighborhoods where it really is smaller infill development and it's not... <coughs> We're not seeing an abundance of it occurring. And yet, tomorrow in the Heritage Committee, you've got two such proposals in two of our downtown heritage neighborhoods. 
one in the Civic Center, one in Victoria Park. Is that, that's what I mean. That's what's happening. But you don't anticipate Okay, well, we are getting a little off topic here now. Um, I don't think we are, Mr. Okay. Chair. Through but the chair, I'll save the rest for later. Jean, care to answer uh, through that? Through the chair, I could just comment on that to say that the applications before Heritage Kitchener are, uh, are outside of the purview of this study. They are not residentially zoned properties. The one on Queen Street specifically is a mixed-use zone property, and I don't recall the zoning of the other property. Okay. Okay, yeah. Councillor Yaneski. The recommendation that's before us here dealing with the uh, setback for the houses and the infield situation, as well as the location of a garage behind the frontage of the uh, building, um, as, as the two uh, proposals, I, I'm in agreement with it. I have no objections to that, and, I, and I'm, I'm happy with that. But it was mentioned that there's two recommendations. So uh, uh, explain to me, there's one recommendation in our staff report, and what we have on the screen is a second recommendation. Is that my understanding, or is it, I'm, I'm confused. Now, you said there was something that was circulated to us. I have nothing in terms of any handouts or anything. I have no idea what you're talking about. So the clerk is putting it on the screen, the amended recommendation that we're suggesting for your consideration. So I can read I'm sorry, it out. I can't hear you. I can read out the amended recommendation. It's on the screen now. So the, the first paragraph is what's in the staff report. The second paragraph says further that staff considers whether any refinements are necessary to the regulations within the proposed bylaw dated July 16th, 2018, attached to report DSD 18017 through the city's neighborhood planning reviews and the residential component of the city's comprehensive review of the zoning bylaw. Okay. All right. That's fine with me. Okay. I never got that, so I, I had no idea where you're com coming from on, on that. The other question I have is trying to understand um, compatibility with the neighborhood in terms of that phrase. And basically, when you build a, uh, a house with a garage set back to meet the frontage, as you have in this one, it meets the setback requirements between the houses that are abutting and is compatible with, and with the area. Same thing when you are uh, looking at the distance of the uh, frontage of the house set back from the street in terms of the, the budding houses. I know the regulations now allow it to be much more closer, but if those houses are set back, this one would sort of meet the character of the area in terms of its setback, correct? What, what about, and then you've got a couple more that you'll be dealing with at the order report in, in, in the future. What happens if you have a house that is intended to be built as an infill situation, meets the setbacks of the garage, the frontage, uh, side yards, and everything else, and happens to be in, the, in, the, in an older part of the city, not in a heritage district, but just an older part of the city, homes built back in the 30s, 40s, and the homes of that style have a certain character of the, of, the 20, of the 30s and the 40s, yet you have something built out of steel and glass and put in the middle that still meets the zoning requirements, but is totally out of character in terms of the design of the building. Is that going to be reflected in any Rian's um, study? So in, through, in the the, through the chair, my recollection of the recommendations from the study, so we're at, what we're talking about this evening are zoning regulations. So no, a zoning bylaw cannot regulate the materials of a building. However, we do have urban, an urban design manual that we're doing a comprehensive review of right now. There will be specific uh, urban design guidelines that deal with uh, those types of matters. Again, maybe not so much in terms of material, but uh, streetscape character and, and things like that will be dealt with through our comprehensive uh, urban design manual update that is, is ongoing as well. So that urban design manual will be uh, updated and brought back to council sometime in the future? Through the chair, yes. It's my understanding that there's public consultation occurring on that in September. Occur occurring when, sorry? In September. Of this year? Yes. Okay, so that's the start of it. 
Uh, staff have initiated that process um, already. I'm, I'm just going by memory here. It's not my project, but staff have initiated that that uh, process. There is a draft of the comprehensive urban design manual out already for public comment. Um, there has been a round of consultation that has occurred okay. already throughout the spring. So then you're intending to bring that to council sometime next year? Mr. Reben? Through the chair, so uh, members of council were circulated a draft copy approximately a month and a half ago. Um, so that copy is out for circulation right now and then it's planned to come back in the new year. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Councillor Marsh. Thank you, Chair Ioannidis. Uh, so I um, am thinking about a few of the other RENES recommendations and um, to be honest, I'm not sure uh, if they were also part of parts or not, um, but the idea of uh, adding carriage house regulations so that um, laneways can, can include some um, infill uh, capacity where people could have a uh, an apartment in the back, or um, uh, I, I'm just wondering about that, as well as uh, buffer zones, so that uh, the, uh, the the areas between high density areas and low density residential areas can be uh, 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 very clearly uh, zoned to be buffer zones, rather than have uh, the um, the, the problem of having such high density right beside low density. So I'm just wondering when are we going to be able to see some of these uh, Reen's recommendations implemented? So through the chair, I don't recall that the, those two items were specific Reen's recommendations. However, um, the carriage houses or coach houses or secondary suites is something that we tabled a first draft of the residential zones last year. Mm -hmm. um, so in the first draft of the new zoning bylaw, you will see that there are regulations for second dwelling units, which is essentially a duplex, so two units in the same building. And there are separate regulations for secondary dwelling units, which is a detached, uh, um, a second unit in a detached building on a lot, and there's regulations for those. Those are out there in draft form. We need to apply the residential zones in order to know where those would be permitted um, across the city. So that is something that once council has a final bylaw in front of them, you would make a decision on that, and then if it's approved, that would be in place um, across the city um, for that. It's not necessarily RIENS specific, although no. we, okay. we would be looking at... Um, where those regulations or whether there should be different regulations for secondary units uh, within the Rien study area and any of these secondary central neighborhood secondary plans. Mm -hmm. um, the buffer zone question is uh, really a land use compatibility question. Um, and from a planning perspective, it's something that we do look at when we update our official plan, which means it's something that we'll look at as we update our secondary plans, um, which is work that is, is underway. Okay, and so the, the secondary plans which are um, going to be created based, uh, for, for these air, uh, areas, the, res the Reens study uh, areas close to the downtown, um, my understanding is that the parts uh, studies will be used to create the secondary plans, and I'm just trying to understand uh, what's the order? Is it after or before the residential zoning bylaw comes forward mm -hmm. next year for approval? So through the chair, that's, we've been talking about the timing of this internally for a number of years about what needs to happen first and what needs to be approved first before this kind of ripple effect um, happens. So most of the parts plans have been endorsed. RIENS has been endorsed. A draft, first draft of the entire new zoning bylaw is out there. We need to put those pieces together and consider it all. And what we're hoping to do is bring forward one package of information to council for a decision. Um, over the next couple of years that would deal with updated land use, so an updated secondary plan together with new urban design guidelines, uh, implementation of the cultural heritage landscape study, and updated zoning and updated urban design guidelines all at the same time. That sounds intense. That's, uh, that's, <laughs> that's going to be a lot. Um, I, I like the... Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll have comment after. Thank you. Mayor Verbanovic. 
Thank you very much, uh, Chair Ioannidis. And uh, I guess, uh, first of all, thanks for, for bringing this forward because I'm, I'm pleased that at least we're dealing with some pieces of this. I, I guess just further building on the questions that Councillor Etherington and Councillor Marsh have asked, um, I understand the desire to, to sort of bring it all forward as one comprehensive document and, and it does make a, a whole lot of sense. Um, but on the other hand, I'm wondering, are there some other pieces that we could deal with um, on, a, on a sort of unique basis as we are dealing with this this evening um, so that we're not seeing all of these components necessarily you know wait upwards of, of two years to um, to come back um, you know and I guess what are the risks of doing that and similarly um, if we don't have the resources what are the roadblocks that are that that are there to sort of give us the ability to do some of that so through the chair it, it is something that we continuously talk about in terms of the timing and how can we get some rules in place quicker and that was the point of this amendment that we're bringing forward. What we've learned over the last, you know, say four years while we're doing these comprehensive processes, um, it, it, we do learn a lot from the different things that we consider. So we've tabled updated residential zones, for example, and as the project manager for the Urban Design Manual goes along, um, and is out there consulting, we learn, you know, this push-pull between what should be a guideline and what should be a zoning regulation. So there is merit in doing multiple things comprehensively because there's still time to do the push-pull in terms of should it be a regulation that's law, applicable law, or should it be something that's more of a guideline and we can still play with them as right. these things are open. Um, we are working really hard to try to bring something forward in spring of 2019 for our de a decision. Um, we have a goal of bringing forward um, the content that was in the statutory public meeting for the zoning bylaw for a decision in the spring of next year. So sorry, the comprehensive document or? Everything that was in the statutory public meeting uh, zoning bylaw, okay. our intent is to have that brought forward in the spring of 2019. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's probably fair to say, uh, especially with this fall being an election year, I mean, there's probably, that's probably the earliest that anything realistically can, can come forward considering, you know, the transition that happens from one council to the next and, and so on. Uh, and then the other stuff would follow in the sort of 12 to 18 months after that? My understanding from Mr. Sloan is that he has a lofty goal of trying to get as much forward to you for a decision in 2019 as possible. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Davey. Thank you. I have a bit of an overarching question. When I, when I look at these, the, the regulations, like, and again, they, they certainly make a lot of sense, but does staff look at them from the standpoint of um, cost to build and ultimately affordable housing in the city. In other words, I guess the question is, do you foresee any of the regulations that we're putting in place here as adding to the base cost of new homes that are being built in Kitchener? Through the chair. Um, I, I don't, Councillor Davies, because I think these are things that, you know, that would be required whether the existing regulations were in place or, or not. Um, I think consumers want a garage, so we we tend to see attached garage garages with new uh, new homes being being proposed, um, and I think uh, I think if anything, I think that with these new regulations, particularly the setback, um, to have them have a, a home that is more in line with what's along the streetscape would be a, certainly be an added bonus. Um, and uh, would be, I think, a welcome addition to your streetscapes. So no, I don't. I, I don't. I really don't see that adding to the cost. And when you've when you've gone through these regulations in terms of where the garages are and all that sort of thing, you've taken into account the the lot widths in an area, whether it will, whether it will support that or not, um, duplexing all these other sorts of um, intensified items we'd like to see more of versus screen filled and. 
the urban sprawl that we all don't want to see? So through the chair, those are considerations that we did through the comprehensive zoning bylaw review. What we tabled in that first draft um, for garage and driveway regulations, and it's just a first draft that's out there for public comment, is a ratio of a percentage of your driveway and garage width tied to the width of your lot. So depending on the width of your lot, that's how wide your driveway and garage could be. So in if you have a narrower lot, you would be restricted to a single loaded driveway, a uh, bigger one double, and then bigger or triple. Um, that's very much still out there for public and stakeholder consultation at this point. Okay, how about like deaths? Because when I see things, and again, I remember when we were going through the Ryan's study, and you had these terrible examples of houses being set back way too far or way too close to the road, and it looked terrible when we were in the neighborhood. Um, but now I'm just wondering with like things like that in garages, we're going from people that are set back, they're out of they're out of line by you know 12 meters, and we're bringing it all the way back into one meter now. I'm just I'm, I'm just worried about going. For example, let's look at garages. Supposing a, like a garage that's perfectly in line, is that going to look significantly better than if the garage protrudes a meter or? two meters, and does that restrict the builder from maybe having a family room behind the garage? These are the questions that I, I think we should be engaging the community with in terms of whether we're being overly restrictive or not and what so the impacts are to the community. Through the chair, that's one reason why we didn't propose to implement at this time through this amendment the, the full recommendation for garages because staff tends to agree that we need to do some more consultation with property owners. Uh, with uh, builders um, and take a look at the neighborhood specifically to see if there's a predominant garage typology in these areas. Are they further recessed or are, or are they so varied that it doesn't matter? You can build whatever type of garage you want. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Etherington. Comment, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. I wanted to say that when members of the public put, participated in RANS, and for that matter, parts during recent months, years, they were led to believe that uh, they would, that those planning uh, policies would quickly protect established residential areas. I believe that now they're being told these legal changes could take another two to three years. And in my opinion, that is far, far too long. In that time, I predict and remain extremely critical of the fact that major developments will continue to take place in established na residential neighborhoods or on the fringes of those neighborhoods. And I think for that reason, we've misled those who participated in rains and parts, and we're still moving at snail pace to protect and preserve our older inner city communities, particularly in our downtown wards. And I would really ask planners to address those priorities. And actually, I don't want to use the words, uh, just move faster to do exactly what they've been telling people they want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Marsh. Okay. So, uh, I, just to continue on uh, my comments earlier, I, I'm very much uh, hap I'm very happy with the uh, recommendation that we have before us in addition to these, this new amendment, I think we're setting a precedent here, and I think it's a reasonable one, uh, because what we're saying is that we are putting in, we're implementing these two regulations now, and we are also allowing for refinements to these uh, recommendations once we look at a more uh, broad, uh, a broader uh, new zoning bylaw. So I'm I'm pleased with this, and I would like to see staff continue on this vein with uh, bringing forward recommendations that have been very much vetted through the community consultations 
uh, with, as, as Councillor Etherington said, uh, with the Green study, with the Part study, but also with, uh, with other consultations, including the first draft of the residential uh, component of the zoning bylaw. I, I think that this is a very positive step in the, for, in the right direction. Uh, I also think that uh, it's, it's important that we uh, ensure that the character of the established neighborhoods that our residents hold near and dear uh, are able to, uh, to be maintained as we intensify. Uh, we do need to build in, up and not uh, uh, add to the urban sprawl unnecessarily, but we need to do that in a responsible way uh, so that the established neighborhoods do not take uh, uh, such a hit that it, they're unrecognizable. Um, I also just I want to uh, publicly thank uh, Natalie Goss for her um, for her work. Uh, she uh, has has done such an, uh, a, a, a very tedious uh, t tedious work with with utmost integrity and um, I believe this might be her last committee meeting here at the city of Kitchener before she moves on to other past greener I don't know <laughs> pastures <laughs> okay thank you Councillor Fernandez uh, yeah thanks so I'm, I'm Encouraged to see that we are um, moving forward on, on a, a couple of the recommendations from Reins, but I too feel a, a sense of uh, impatience uh, around how challenging and difficult and um, slow moving this process is. But I, I mean, are we, we're looking at 50,000 properties, we're looking at an entire city, and um, I recognize that it's a huge, huge body of work. But I think the concerns that I've heard from, from fellow councillors and I've heard from the committee, but the community over and over again is the concern about protecting our existing neighborhoods. And I'll be the first one to say I, I don't want to see any more sprawl and I want to stop us from, from clearing out any more farmland and green space. But we don't want our city to be completely changed in, in those neighborhoods that are so important and are really the heart in some, in, to some degree. Notwithstanding, I mean, I'm a suburban girl, so, but, but they, they, they bring a part of our history and our culture to life. People walk those streets, and you know I did again this weekend through the Blues Festival, and we biked. My husband and I biked through them, and you know there are times when we say, "Gosh, we really should have looked at some of these older neighborhoods." But there are times when, when I think, "Well, maybe I would be afraid of what's happening to some of those neighborhoods." And when I read statements like this, the property owners have the right to make an application to vary these standards as with any zoning bylaw regulation through a public process as there may be circumstances where it may be warranted to do so. It's concerning. And the Committee of Adjustment, I know, is that venue and that opportunity for those applications to happen. And if they are going to be changing our streetscape and our character, I think we have to be very careful how those um, recommendations are put forward from staff. And I know that they're trying to, to keep the integrity, but the pressure from the development industry to make more money on those older lots or those old properties must be very hard for our staff to, to resist and to stand up against. And so I, I, with all due respect, I know um, they're trying their best. And if there was a way that we could move this forward faster, um, I appreciate the mayor making a suggestion that maybe there is another piece that we can pull out from those recommendations. Maybe there is something we can uh, put forward in an independent or separate zoning bylaw amendment like we have here. So if staff could, could consider that in the coming months, I think that would be really um, a benefit for our existing neighborhoods and for our community. Uh, news to me that Ms. Goss maybe is leaving us, uh, and I would reiterate, um, it has been a long journey for you in this Crosby uh, zoning bylaw that you've had to work on, so thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Davey. 
Thank you. I just, well, again, I wanted to reiterate that it, I, I'm in support of this um, and, and this work, uh, but I do think it's, it's worth repeating that you know, what we're doing here is we're correcting some of the, it's like almost like the wild west in terms of development and some of those ridiculous setbacks that we see in, in houses where the garage sticks out miles further than the house and, and can, can ruin the natural setting. But at the same time, we do have to remember that um, greenfield development, which is effectively urban sprawl once we, we get past the countryside line, has a tremendous business advantage uh, to any sort of infill development except for the, your high rises. So that's the only time they can compete. So we have to be cognizant that if we, if we overcorrect, if we overregulate, if we have completely rigid circumstances, if we don't allow that intensity, then what you're really going to be doing is you're going to be working against that thing that we all want to, want to achieve. So we do that at our own peril. I don't see that yet, but I just I think it's one of those things that when we're going through it, we sort of need to keep that in the back of our minds to make sure we don't have those bad things happen in our community. Councillor Schneider. Thank you, Chair. I, and I, just, uh, I, I echo what uh, a lot of my fellow councillors have said tonight. I think this is a, a great start. It, it's kind of an early win, but I, I do think that there are other areas, too, where we could maybe uh, move a little quicker on some of the things uh, in, in Crosby, and that would be great to see that. And I just wanted to point out, too, that uh, we need to add an R into further on the uh, recommendation. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mayor Verbanovic. Much and um, as I uh, as I said uh, earlier, I'm very happy to, to see this uh, before us and to uh, to support the motion that Councillor Marsh um, has made. Um, you know, this is a this is a huge body of work. I mean, it's been 33 years, 33 years since the last time we've updated the zoning bylaw. Um, and it'll be 34 probably by the time by the time it's it's done. The, our community has changed significantly in that in that time frame, um, both in terms of its own natural evolution, but also in terms of what the expectations are of the provincial government in terms of this area and how it fits into the, the province's overall growth management um, strategy. And so, you know, it is, for those reasons, also a piece of work. While you don't want it taking too long, you also don't want to rush it um, and make potentially significant mistakes that then need to be um, unwound. Um, Councilor Fernandez pointed out, you know, from my questioning, are there any other things? And, you know, if, if we are going to, if we are going to see it coming back in, in the spring, which is probably the, you know, most realistic and earliest possible time. That's great, um, but if we're going to, if we're sensing that there is any uh, any give on those deadlines, then I think, quite frankly, at a at a senior administration level, we have to see what resourcing do we need to put at it so that 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 doesn't happen, and or B, are there some things we can deal with on this one-off basis in order to to make some further uh, inroads and, and move things along, but that's you know something uh, to be reflected in the minutes and for the next council um, to to consider and 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 deal with uh, post uh, post this fall. But in the meantime, uh, this will move. Uh, this is, this is a, a good step forward, and uh, and we'll and we'll take it from there. Thank you. We have no further comments. I'm just going to make one small comment and then, and then we can go on with the recorded vote. Uh, one of the things that I've, that I feel that we're sometimes not cognizant of is, and I hope we don't fail to recognize this, but it is, it is when we do add any forms of restriction, I don't think these ones are today, but any forms of restrictions when it comes to any forms of new types of housing or development within our city is only going to increase the necessity of having affordable housing because the more restrictions you, you create, the more difficult it is to build, less possibilities of, of creating affordable housing. And 
that's where I think we need to be cognizant of. And sometimes I feel like we're almost crossing that line sometimes. And But with this, these, what do I see here, are very, I think, uh, gentle, gentle uh, amendments. To, and I feel that I think they will do is keep some of the integrity that the public has has uh, requested and as well will be able to facilitate some form of development. And with that, there's a recorded vote. Moved by Councillor Fernandez, I mean, uh, Councillor Marsh. Wrong button. What's that? I voted yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Here, let me, let me cancel me. <coughs> Carried unanimously. Thank you. And that concludes our Planning and Strategic Initiative Committee for Monday, August 13th, 2018. Thank you.